Right. Good morning, FanFest. Ah, uh, it's afternoon. Uh. <laughs> right, so who have we got here? E-Uni? You can speak. It's okay. This is very interactive. Uh, PL? No PL? Any goons? Hey! <laughs> right, folks. Um, we are going to talk today about, uh, about Ars Bellica, the art of war. Um, a couple of people asked me, is it going to be... Uh, how to fight in high sec. Is it going to be how to fight in low sec? No, 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 no. It's not about that tactical level stuff. Um, we're going to look more at strategy and doctrine and where it all comes from. Um, we're going to look at what strategy is, what strategy isn't. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the theorists that are out there. Um, we're going to look at Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, and there's another couple of, uh, couple of quotes in there. And then if you guys have got anything as well. Uh, like I say, highly interactive session. So if you guys have got any experience, anybody here read Clausewitz? Hard work, isn't it? Started it. Yeah, yeah, started it. That's really good. That's where most people get with close of it. They get, they start it and they go, "This is just hard work." I started, uh, ah, Sun Tzu. Anyone read? <laughs> and more people have read Sun Tzu. Good. Um, so we'll have a look at some of the stuff close of it said and some of the stuff Sun Tzu said. But more importantly, why am I actually talking to you? He said, "Why should you listen to that Scottish guy up the front?" Uh, right, my. Uh, I have literally, uh, just to make sure that I made it to FanFest this year, uh, left the military after 28 years. I timed everything perfectly uh, to get out of the military and come to FanFest, uh, but don't tell my boss that. Um, <laughs> I've been teaching leadership, doctrine, um, uh, strategy, uh, operational level stuff and tactical level stuff for many, many years, uh, hence why uh, I thought I've got a little bit of credibility to talk to you. So we talk about strategy. What is strategy? In the military, uh, anybody here with a bit of military background? Yeah. Okay, people re recognize that? Strategic, operational, tactical levels. Um, uh, anybody in the emergency services? People potentially talk about gold, silver and bronze. Command levels. So, uh, strategy is very easy. You've got the strategic level. The strategic level is all about the ends. The ends are, what am I trying to achieve? Anybody from Brave in here? No, their strategic end may have been, I want to hold solve. Now it's, I want to find a new home. <laughs> but a strategic, a strategic aim is... Right, prime example, E-Uni. What's E-Uni's strategic aim? What do we think? To teach new players. Okay, teach new players. Sometimes in E-Uni we forget that. Sometimes we forget that our aim is to teach new players. <clears throat> Excuse me, and if we're not teaching new players, we're, uh, we're potentially failing them. I'm not checking for an important phone call from my wife or my girlfriend. I'm just, uh, I've got my notes on this. Uh, love you too. <laughs> I don't think I've pulled, but we'll see after a couple of beers. Uh, right, ends. Ends are your objectives. Um, if you accomplish your objectives, you get to where you want to be. Um, so, like we say, uh, holding solve can be an objective because they're verb related. Uh, funding your playtime monthly through a plex could be your ends. Um, so, just have a think about the kind of end. Do you all know what the ends of your corporation are? Provide Sorry? Mm -hmm. To provide what? Content. Ah, so to provide fun gameplay content in NullSec. For whom? <laughs> For everybody or just yourselves? Okay. So, so theoretically, your aim, if everybody else hates it and has a crap game because of the way you play, you've met your aim. Is that why we're in the Okay, well. <laughs> I rest my case. So, if you don't know what your alliance aims are or what your corporation aims are, I'd go away and check because it's very difficult to be able to turn around to your management and say, does what we're about to do meet our aims? If you don't know what the aims are. So, we've got the strategic aims. The operational aims, that's how you're actually going to achieve it. How am I going to hold solve? Apparently, being nice to PL doesn't work. <laughs> so you may need a more effective command structure. You may need more effective plans. How am I going to fund my monthly plex to plex my account? So you need to have that thought of where I want to get to, how I'm going to get there, and finally, you've got the tactical level, the resources, the means that link the ways and the ends. So, what do we have as means in all our corporations and alliances? What sort of means do we have? 
What resources do we have? Okay. Enough drills. Okay, so practice. Guns. So equipment and resources. Practice. Skills and knowledge. What else? Intelligence. Intelligence. Very important. And we'll talk about intelligence later on. What else do we have as resources? Why are you guys all here? Are you here because you hate Eve? No, you're here because you love Eve. Actually, you don't think about that, but your passion for the game is a resource. If you love doing what you're doing in game, you will do more of it. So if you understand that, that's a resource. Sorry? Terror is a resource too. Right, I'll, 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 okay, terror is a resource. Let's change that to influence yeah. because it summarizes everything. You can influence people in lots of ways. I can influence you by playing station games. Who here is in a corporation that plays station games? You're a bunch of wankers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I think that out loud? <laughs> but again, if that, meets your, if that meets your objective, that's fantastic. I hate it. Hate my, my, my new players then decide not to play the game and then CCP don't get money to develop your game. But if that works for you, that's, uh, that's fine. So, ends, ways and means. Strategy is really, really simple. No, it's not. Strategy is not simple at all. Right, the political objective is often too ambiguous. Why did NATO go into Afghanistan? I'm going back to military stuff here because it's where I come from. It was the war... Terror. The war on terror. Okay, what is the aim of a war on terror? To end terrorism. Is ending terrorism by flattening a country that already f is flattened? Anybody been to Afghanistan before? No. You know what? Oh, we will turn Afghanistan into a moonscape. Afghanistan started off as a bloody moonscape. <laughs> All we did was move some bricks around. Um, so if your aim is to end terrorism, you actually have to work out, whoa, how the hell are we going to do that? Because terrorism is just a bunch of people that have no other political means of getting their point across other than resorting to violence and targeting potentially everybody. Actually, turning around and going, it's a war on terror, means it's unwinnable. <coughs> you set yourself an aim that's unachievable, and that is asking for failure, hence why we haven't got what we wanted out of Afghanistan. Right. Uh, okay, I'm coming up to election. I've got something I really want to do, but I know it's going to cheese me off. Actually... I know that in order to save Brave, what I need to do is charge everybody in Brave a billion-esque, and I can use that money to save it. Do, do you think people are going to go for that? No. So you have to actually be realistic about what you're... Uh, I do apologise if there's anybody here in Brave. We are taking a dig at you. But uh, hey, that's what happens. <laughs> everybody wants something different. How many people have been in an alliance where there have been frictions because different organisations want different things? Okay, so you have to be aware of what I want. My aims might not tie into what your aims. Those guys on the chair, there's, there's seats in there if you want to get a little bit more comfortable. Ah, our good Kaldari brethren, bringing you missiles. Right, we underestimate the enemy's capabilities and win power, uh, willpower. How many times have you jumped into a fight guaranteed to win and lost? Or the other way, we overestimate them. How many of you, when you were younger players, if those you can remember that far back, uh, uh, saw a crow jump into system and docked up? Yes? I did that the first time I saw a crow. Woo! Dock up. The first time I flew a crow, everybody was docking up. I had no idea. In fact, I don't even think it was fitted. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because we overestimate what we don't know. If we don't have, like somebody said, intelligence, we make assumptions and that can lead us into dangerous places. Anyway, let's get to the thrust of this because I know you all want to go to the, uh, the core element. Right, Karl von Clausewitz. Born in uh, 1780, uh, so Napoleonic era, he, uh, he joined the army very young, I think he was 12, when he joined the Lance Corporal, and he left as a major, he died as a major general, um, dealing with a massive cholera attack. So, um, so he did all right for himself. Uh, he wrote on war, eight volume book, finished after his death by his wife. Even Clausewitz himself said, some of my books are shit. Because <laughs> it took him so long to write that his thoughts had changed. He took part in enough conflicts to go, actually, what I originally thought was happening wasn't happening. I'll change that. But he didn't change it in the books. So that's why reading the books, whilst compulsory on some military courses, is really, really hard work. I definitely wouldn't recommend it to anybody unless you're uh, an insomniac. But like I say, it's read in military academies because of the fact that 
he was one of the first people to go, war isn't a science. You cannot turn around and do mathematics on war. You need to understand that it's an art form. It's the same way people turn around and go, actually, a computer can't create. It can only do what you've designed it to do. But it can't turn around and create something new. It can't put love and passion into it. And that's what he was saying warfare is all about. There is an element of warfare that you cannot compute. Up till then, it was a, if you've got cavalry, this is what you do with them. Form square, form line, you're going to win, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and nobody worried when it didn't happen. He was one of the first people to go, actually, you need to think about this. There's more to this than just numbers. Um, in, uh, in Vietnam, anybody heard of it? I know yeah. there's young, young people nowadays that haven't heard of the, the Vietnam War. Uh, America got really into this because computers were just coming in in the 70s. So they were all big about, right, how can we help computers? How can we use computers to help us win the war? Uh, so the Rand Corporation devised a number of metrics. They threw all the metrics into the computer and went, when are we going to win? And the computer said, well, you've already won. We've done the maths, you've already won. And the reason it didn't work was because they were trying to look at statistics and numbers and quantities, the figures that they were getting to feed in were all made up. You know, you blow up a little five-gallon five gallon oil drum, you don't report it as a five-gallon oil drum. You report it as an enemy petrol compound. Because <laughs> it makes you look good, but the people making the decisions get the wrong information. So again, if we don't pass the right information up, there are problems. But like I say, he never finished it. His wife, who had never been to, uh, to war, finished it for him. Um, it's very difficult. Like I say, it contradicts itself in lots of places. Um, and like we'll talk about, is it still relevant? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a number of uh, components that Clausewitz said were key to warfare. Do exactly the same for Sun Tzu. And then we can have a, uh, a talk about whether or not that's still uh, practical. He said, war is a continuation of policy by other means. And that's, have people heard that quoted before? Yep. What doesn't often get quoted is the bit he wrote after it. And to politics it must return. War, from his perspective, was all about influence. If you cannot achieve something diplomatically, you beat your opponent with a big stick, and when they surrender, you sit down at the table and you talk. Not when diplomacy breaks down, you, s you let slip the dogs of war and completely annihilate your, uh, your opponent. That wasn't what Clausewitz was saying. He was saying war is just another political tool. Um, and, uh, and we have issues with that when we have the government interfering with the military. Um, and we'll talk about Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu said, look, once you give me the military control, you step back. You let me do my job, and then I will hand the opponent's head to you. You don't tell me what I can and can't do. Uh, I know it's a bit early. A very interesting story. He told the, uh, the emperor that he could train anybody to be a soldier. Uh, you heard this story before? Somebody has. Um, the emperor said, not entirely believe you. So he, so he gave uh, Sun Tzu all his concubines. Um, and there was quite a few because the emperor was a bit of a lad. Um, <laughs> he split them into two armies. Uh, gave, them all, gave them each general concubines in charge of them all, armed them all up, and said, right, fight. And they all just went, eh, we don't fight, we're, uh, we're concubines, we do something else. That's very much like fighting, starts with the same letter, but isn't fighting. Um, so uh, Sun Tzu executed the generals. And the emperor went, whoa, 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 whoa. She's my favorite concubine, you can't kill her. And Sun Tzu went, no. When you give an order to go to war, you let the military carry on with it. When we finish doing our job, we will hand it back. And surprisingly enough, from that point on, the concubines all fought really effectively. But his perspective was, wasn't the same as Clausewitz. Clausewitz said, war is politics at, at all stages. Uh, Sun Tzu said, no, no, there's politics, then there's war. So there was, a, there was a little bit of a difference there. So one of the key things that uh, Clausewitz said was, select and maintain your aim. Like he said there, you need to know what you are trying to achieve. Um, have you always known what you're trying to achieve every time you take a fleet out? No, not always. Does what your fleet do, go, goes out to do, does that always tie in with the corporation and the alliance's aim? No. Goodness me, people are getting in the way of our aim because they're going off and doing fun stuff. <laughs> How dare you? Anybody who's, anybody who's having fun at Eve, you're obviously missing the point. So, yeah, he talks about doctrine. Uh, he says it's for the commander to understand, but it's not for the commander to follow slavishly. Um, let me have a quick read. 
His next one, concentration of forces. Uh, how do we do that in EVE? Sorry? Blah. So I've never heard that. I'm in the uni, I don't know what a blob is. <laughs> okay, we blob our forces together. How else can we concentrate our forces? Yeah, we can sign them in. Sorry? Not anymore. <laughs> well, well, ah, they haven't got rid of them though. And don't say nerf, say balanced. Just because your gameplay style doesn't, doesn't, isn't as fun as it was before, it's all, it's all about the big balance thing. I'm getting the CCP vibe here. I'm gonna, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stand up here for 40 minutes, tell you absolutely nothing, and at the end of it, you'll still cheer, and I'll go, success! <laughs> and then they'll, uh, they'll give me a CCP t-shirt. Uh, right. So as Little Heart says, look, if you're going to split your forces, make sure they can get to each other. Because that whole point was, um, it's all about concentrating your forces. Uh, Sun Tzu, again, uh, he talked about uh, um, uh, concentration forces, and we'll look at that in a second. But he, he basically says, if you're surrounded by your opponent, tactically, you've got the advantage. Because your opponent is spread out in a huge circle. You've concentrated your forces, they haven't. So again, he understood the, uh, the importance of concentration of forces. Right, center of gravity. People heard of this before? Right, how many engineers have we got in the audience? How many aircraft engineers? One, two, oh, come on, proper trade. Um, identify your opponent's center of gravity. What's the center of gravity? It's the point around which mass will rotate when subjected to a force. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> when we're talking, when we're talking uh, doctrine, center of gravity is the one key point that will destroy your opponent. GE? Will that destroy your opponent? I'm not too sure. I don't think it will destroy Brave at all. I think Brave will learn from it and move on. Sorry? Shooting the fleet commander. Okay. Does shooting the fleet commander destroy your opponent? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Yes and no. We're not talking tactical level here, we're talking big picture. If I shoot a fleet commander, do I achieve my, my, uh, my corporation's aims? I might win a fight. Am I going to achieve an aim? Who knows? Depends what your aim is, yeah, potentially. But actually, this stuff isn't used at the fight level, this is used at the big thinking level. So, E-Uni. Yeah, if you can do that. Yeah. If that one station means they can do nothing else. Remember, as well as center of gravity, what you also have is um, sort of key weaknesses. So you can identify what your opponent's key weakness is. E-Uni, what sort of key weaknesses do we have in E-Uni? Lots, Lots of newbies. Sorry? Oh, okay, but what else? What other weaknesses? Come on, take part. Okay, well, actually, we spread out, but yeah, we, we've, when we concentrate a force of lots of newbies, it makes it very easy to attack. Station game wankers. Um, <laughs> so, sorry, it's slipping out again. It's my Tourette. Um, right, what else do we have as a weakness in EVE Uni? Okay, relatively low skill points. What else? Sorry? They could be a what? An somebody else. A what? Spies. Uh, spies? Nobody uses spies in EVE. What game are you playing? <laughs> yeah, uh, there's lots of stuff going on. But, okay, have a, and, and, and the reason I get to play EVE Uni is because it's potentially easy for you. I, I don't have to expose any of your weaknesses because it's easy enough to spo expose EVE Uni's weaknesses because we don't care. Bring spies into our corporation. What will we do? If anything, we might give them some advice on how to go out and be better spies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we tell everybody where we are, what doctrines we're flying, what we're going to do, and the fact that everybody's got no points. So unless you're one of these uh, tiny penis people that likes to play station games with your, <laughs> with your shiny T3s and go, I killed a noob that doesn't know what he's doing, look at me. Does it get you any girls? <laughs> didn't, didn't think so. Right, um, centre of gravity. How do you destroy E-Uni? One thing, destroy E-Uni. Station games doesn't destroy your uni, it just pisses people off and... Sorry? Okay, only one person could do that. Would that stop your uni from reforming? No. How do you destroy your uni? 
you destroy E-Uni's reputation. If you want to destroy E-Uni, you destroy the reputation. But it's identity. You know, if people turn around and go, don't join E-Uni, because they're shit for all the wrong reasons. Once that gets out there, you can destroy E-Uni. So if you're looking at destroying an opponent, work out what's going to destroy them. Not what you think might upset them, not what you think might cause a problem, but what's the one thing. Right, um, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Station Camper there, uh, Pursuit of Happiness by any chance? No? Okay, anybody here been griefed by Pursuit of Happiness before? <laughs> um, <laughs> pursuit of Happiness, what's their centre of gravity? What gets you kicked from POH? Losing a shiny ship. Their center of gravity is their shiny ship kill board ratio. So I know how to defeat Pursuit of Happiness. How I turn that into an actual plan is something different. So you have to identify the center of gravity before you can turn it into a plan. Um, and most importantly, attack. If you're trying, I mean, again, we're talking close of it's not Eve, because some of this will tie into Eve Online, some of it won't. Um, I just realized I've sworn really badly here, haven't I? Kids, if you watch this on YouTube, I'm really, really sorry. Daddy's a very bad man. Um, <laughs> the only way you can defeat your opponent, from Clausewitz's perspective, was to attack them. We have different ways of doing it. Um, what ways can we attack an opponent that don't involve shooting them? <laughs> okay. You can attack their reputation. You can make them cheesed off. Yep, you can destroy their supply chain. Bribing important members, some members Yeah, you can use spies. Not that anybody uses spies in EVE. Um, <laughs> lots of ways of attacking your opponent. So, um, let's move quickly on to Sun Tzu. How are we doing time-wise? Am I going to get... Sh Ooh, yeah, we're uh, we're kind of there. Um, I say this is a 90-minute presentation. I'm trying to whip through in, uh, in, in less time than that. Sun Tzu may or may not have existed. For the purpose of this, let us assume he does, because otherwise the second half is just a bit of a waste. Um, but there is some thought that actually he might have been a number of thinkers who got together and their works were published. Um, he was born a little bit before Clausewitz. Um, he was a general and he wrote The Art of War. Um, and a lot of what he wrote is based on his religious conceptual thinking about stuff. So if you read The Art of War, it's actually a really easy read. It's almost like a, a, a poetry book. It's lots of small, pithy quotes that you can go away, take away and think about. And I definitely, if you play Eve, I definitely recommend having a quick, really, even if you just Google it and get some stuff online, have a look at Art of War. There's some really good stuff in there. Um, up until about 1970, he wasn't really used in the West. Um, it, we don't have anybody here from Serenity, do we? Oh, thank goodness. That would have been really bad if I had the Chinese delegation sitting at the back going, oh, that's all bollocks. Uh, he, he had a massive influence on revolutionaries. So Ho Chi Minh uh, read and applied uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, the communist states read and applied Sun Tzu. Uh, Mao Zedong as well. Um, all these people looked at what he had to say because he was thinking conceptually. Very much like Clausewitz did a few hundred years later, Sun Tzu took a step back and actually thought about thinking about war rather than just thought about thinking about war itself. Um, what he said was, um, don't assume your enemy's not going to come. What you have to do is you have to assume they're going to come. You have to assume they're going to come and you have to plan for it. I apologise for making the cameraman's life harder by wandering all over the stage, but that's, uh, that's just what I do. Um, von Moltke, he was a contemporary of, uh, of Clausewitz. And again, it's a lot of understanding the situation and understanding the concepts so that you can apply the concepts when the situation comes into it. Uh, yeah. Um, people here heard of the Korean War? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people haven't. You say, uh, uh, a lot of people haven't. Korean War, America made a number of significant mistakes. They wrote it all down and then made exactly the same mistakes in the Vietnam War. <laughs> right, any Russians in here? Okay, a couple of Russians. When the Russians went into Afghanistan, they made a number of really, really fundamental mistakes. Because when Russia went into Afghanistan, they went, well, we have trained to fight NATO on the plains of Europe. 
So we will go into Afghanistan with the training and the doctrine that we have. And they made really stupid mistakes. I do apologize, but they were very stupid. <laughs> then NATO did exactly the same thing. Because <laughs> there was this idea that, oh, well, you know, Russia made all those stupid mistakes, but we're so much better than Russia. Uh, so what are you trained for? Well, we're trained to fight Russia in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the flat plains of Europe. So what are you going to do in Afghanistan? Well, we'll go in with our Russian doctrine. Our doctrine to fight the Russians in Central Europe. Well, yeah, that didn't work for them. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. It'll be different for us. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about when I say NATO. No, I mean in the oh, oh, yes. Oh, goodness me. Nobody has ever done well out of a war in Afghanistan apart from the, uh, the Afghans <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> uh, yeah, he left eventually. Um, <laughs> where was I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's understanding the thoughts, not following your doctrine slavishly. Like pe these people have said, doctrine is not something you should look at and go, right, step one, we do this. It's uh, here's stuff that worked. How many of you have changed jobs? Uh, when you get to your new job, uh, the person in there before you gives you a list of some ideas. A little bit of a handover. Do you guys see that in work? Yeah, that's all do military doctrine is. It's handover notes from the last guy. Doesn't mean that everything that happened for them will happen for you. And never assume it will. So what did Sun Tzu have to say? So how do we prepare for our force, for an, an opponent's forces in, uh, in EVE Online? Okay, larger blob. <laughs> Unless you're in the uni, N plus one doesn't work. N plus 100, maybe. <laughs> as long as 50 of them are, uh, are flying blackbirds. Sorry? Okay, you could, well, that's the second one. Uh, anger and confuse your opponent. Uh, so does trolling work? Unless you're obviously playing station games, and then in which case we don't... I assure you it works. Yeah, so actually, trolling is really effective. Why does trolling work? People can't think straight when they're angry. Yeah, if you're pissed off, you're going to make the wrong decisions. And more often than not, you will end up getting into a fight that sensibly you otherwise wouldn't have got into. And your opponent knows this. So, uh, so yeah... Um, find out what binds your opponent's troops and break those bonds. Yeah. How can we do that in EVE? Shoot, shoot the FC, yeah. Okay, well, okay, that works as well. Um, E-Uni, it's great, you shoot the FC, and then what you have is 150 people going, oh, I don't know what I'm doing! <laughs> don't try that tactic, it doesn't work. <laughs> that's me, that's me kick from E-Uni, great. Um, Attack your opponent when, where, and how they least expect it. Again, how can we do that in EVE? Sorry? Okay, lots of spies. You know what? If, if we know what fleet our opponent's going to bring, bring a fleet to counter it. Unless you're in the EU versus RVB war. The problem with that was we had so many spies on both sides that we'd pick a doctrine. They'd know about it 10 seconds later and reship. So we'd reship, then they'd reship, then we'd re... And we never actually got a fight out of it. <laughs> but we did reship an awful lot. <laughs> so uh, the actual winners there were anybody who'd thrown stuff on the market. <laughs> <coughs> Although that's an interesting one because, actually, if you can go to your opponent's staging system and buy up all the ammunition, fantastic. And if you're really good, you can sell it back to them <laughs> so that when they blow you up, you end up making a profit. <laughs> All's fair in love and war. Right, uh, interesting one at the bottom. Um, uh, colonel John Boyd, uh, influential American uh, Air Force colonel. Uh, I believe he had Vietnam experience. He was the guy who designed the F-15, F-16 uh, and was, was involved in lots of other programs. And he was basically saying, what we need to do is we need to get inside what's called their OODA loop. Their uh, observe, orient, decide, orientate, decide and act loop. We need to be able to look at what's going on and be able to do things faster than our opponent. Uh, and that was one of the things that uh, NATO used during the Cold War. That was part of NATO doctrine was the fact that because the Soviet forces were very structured and hierarchical, um, it was sometimes very difficult for them to change tempo, whereas NATO troops were a little bit more flexible, so even though we didn't have as much 
in terms of numbers, we could be a little bit more flexible and hopefully um, that, would, uh, that would help us uh, defeat the Russians, no offence. Um, <laughs> but how do we do that in EVE? Okay, spies. Headshot the FC, okay, because you can slow the decision-making process down. Yeah. Ja oh, yes, jamming people. <laughs> Anybody here hate jams? <laughs> Go and learn how to play properly. Play Kaldari, it's much more fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, like we talked about with, uh, with uh, uh, trolling them, uh, with, with trolling making mistakes, apply pressure, keep applying pressure, get your opponent to make those mistakes, get inside your opponent's decision cycle and they will always be reacting to you. If you're on the attack and they go and reship, you're already a step ahead of them because if you know what they're doing, you can reship to something that counters it. So again, if you're on the attack, if you're on the offensive and somebody's having to react, they're already a step behind you. So if you can do that and stay on the offensive, you've got a much higher, uh, higher success of what's going on. Right, uh, having a look at his quick four rules in the last eight minutes uh, will be great. Um, he was basically saying you need strong leadership. What's the difference between leadership and management? I don't want any management gurus talking bollocks. <laughs> One difference between leadership and management is that leadership is inspirational. You do not need to inspire people to manage resources. People that say, oh, there's so much between leadership and management, that's rubbish. Leadership is just management with a little bit of inspiration. So, in order to be effective in a battle, you need to have inspirational leadership. How many of you potentially come from corporations or alliances where some levels of management is not inspirational and easily approachable and you don't see them on a day-to-day -day basis? Or do you all have that? See, that suggests that actually we don't have leadership in some corporations. We have fantastic management, don't get me wrong, and some corporations are managed really, really well but some of them potentially don't have effective, strong leadership. So have a look at your own corporations. Do you have management or leadership? And if you do have management, how can you turn that into leadership? Um, what do you say? Yeah, talking about fighting and not fighting. Uh, I don't know if that's applicable to Eve. How many of you have been in a fleet where the FC has thrown you at a certain death just for a laugh? <laughs> that'll, be all, that'll be all of us. So maybe that one doesn't apply because the difference between, uh, the big difference between Eve and these guys is we do it for fun. So actually, we don't care about dying, potentially, as long as we're having fun. So that makes a difference. Uh, yeah, united in purpose. How many of you have been in a fleet where you haven't got a clue what the aim of the fleet is? Okay, then how can you be united in purpose if you don't know what the FC is trying to do and trying to achieve? Yes, you have OPSEC, because we have spies for the one or two really bad corporations, and the rest of us don't have any. Um, but uh, yeah, so united in purpose. So you have to have that balance between OPSEC and actually giving people the information they need. Yeah, wait for the right opponent to attack, which usually means the first person that jumps through the gate. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, run away! And like Sun Tzu said, you know what? If you send me out to do a job, Emperor, your responsibility stops. I go out, I do the job, I come back and hand over to you. So again, completely different from Clausewitz, who said, look, it's all political. Uh, rule two, concentration of force. We talked about that. Um, and he said, uh, he gave some tactics and put some thought into it as to what you could do when you outnumber. Now, in EVE, outnumbering doesn't necessarily mean in quantity. It could be capability. So if you out-capability your opponent 10 to 1, here's some ideas. How do you surround an opponent in EVE? Bubbles. Bubbles. What else? Gate. Gate camps. So all these things can be applied to EVE. Like I say, go away, have a look at... Uh, uh, what Sun Tzu has to say and work out how we can apply it to Eve. So yeah, you can gate camp them, you can surround them in a way that doesn't physically mean I am all the way around your, uh, your, physical, uh, your physical resources. So again, like he said, um, surround them, attack them, divide them, and actually dividing them doesn't need to be um, in terms of, uh, uh, of combat. You could uh, find uh, a spy or something just to make life a little bit harder. Reduce their combat effectiveness as the military people would say. And again, if your opponent vastly outnumbers you or vastly out capabilities you, make sure that if you want to, you can run away. Unless, of course, you just want to die in a ball of fire and have fun. Bloody station games. Okay, Sun Tzu, he talks about spies. 
dirty, rotten spies. How many of you in corporations that have spies? How can you sleep at night? <laughs> but actually, how important is intelligence to Eve? It's critical. Critical. It's not very important. It's critical. If you have no intelligence, you might as well stop playing unless you want to be a miner. Who here mines? Uh, I don't know if I could teach you how to be more effective at killing rocks, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Surround the rocks. If you outnumber your rocks 10 to 1, surround the rocks. If the rocks outnumber you, make sure you can escape. That's about the best info I can give to, uh, to miners here. Get your knowledge. Mining, no ships. Sorry? No mining, no ships. That's true. Mining's really important, just not my cup of tea. <laughs> right, one of the things he was saying was actually... War is really expensive. And actually, how expensive is war in Eve? Yeah, war becomes really expensive in Eve as well. So what Sun Tzu was saying was use your spies. Don't start a war just because you think it's a good idea. Use your spies. And for spies, we can, uh, we can, um, we can put intelligence in there. Use your intelligence to work out when to have the war. When to have the war and how to have it. And interesting enough, very much like uh, Clausewitz, uh, he says, you've got to attack. Now, obviously, he was talking about chopping people up into little pieces with swords, whereas actually attacking to us could mean financial warfare. It could be reputational warfare. It could be killing every FC and podding them eventually. There's loads of ways that we can attack our opponent that don't necessarily just involve um, throwing bits of hot metal at them. And I say bits of hot metal because, quite frankly, anybody that uses a laser just uh, isn't worth talking about. Unless you fight rocks, in which case, crack on. Um, we love the fact that you give us ships to blow up. I say ships to blow up, that makes it sound like I'm out in fleets all the time. E-Uni Management has me doing staff stuff all day long. I would love to be able to undock. But anyway, as he says, it's all about having a fight. It's all about having a nice, quick war. Um, again, doesn't necessarily tie into what's going on in most Eve things, because we actually have war for fun. But actually, if you want to defeat your opponent, and you've got a number of opponents, so if you're potentially holding solve, and you want to defeat an opponent, you want to, you want the war to, win, to end quickly. Because a quick war is a cheap war. You only have to look at that in, uh, in the media. Real world wars, people want them. People talk about them being fast, because a fast war is a quick war, is a cheap war. Well, obviously, a fast war is a quick war. And again, make sure the fight meets the aims. Potentially not something we would do in EVE Online, because we want to have fun. So. Theoretically, that says the art of war in Eve. I'm open to suggestions. If it says, I lick baboon's backside, I wouldn't know. People heard of that? Know the enemy, know yourself, and you can win 100 wars? Yes? No? Okay, a couple of you. Um, how do we do that in Eve? Okay, so apparently the answer to everything in Eve is spies. You know what? I have a little bit of a worry that some of you are turning EVE Online into a game with a lack of integrity. Um, I think you're not all playing this game as the lawful good paladins that we should be doing. Um, and I think you've, uh, you've missed the, uh, the bright shining light of, uh, of good and holiness. Uh, right, so how can we know about ourselves and know about our enemies? How can we translate what he was saying to, uh, to EVE Online? Yeah, got, all right, let's take spies and intelligence, okay? We'll take that as a red. What else? You know where you're strongest if you are a small gang sleeping yep. on stone, manage big fleets. Yep. And saving those rounds. If you're small, attack. Do what you're good at. Yep, do what you're good at. Yeah, find out what your enemy does. Find out how your enemy fights. So again, part of intelligence. But again, one of the things we don't potentially look at is how do I fly my ships? I know in the uni we say to people, right, here's how we think we should fit your ship. Go away, it's a brand new fit, and then go and play with it. Because the way I play EVE isn't the way that any of you play EVE, which is probably a good thing from your point, because uh, I'm a bit rubbish. Um, but actually, I might fight and fly the same ship in a completely different way to you, which would require a slightly different fit. So actually, knowing yourself is potentially knowing, right, how, what ships do I fly well, and there's an element of what ships do I enjoy flying, because that's not necessarily the same thing. Because you may want to go out and fly a ship really well, but you also might want to go out and just fly for fun. So assuming that we're going to try and fly well, identify what ships you fly well and how you fly them. And also, not necessarily just what your opponents fly. It's easy to find out what your opponents fly, 
But how they fly them and how they fight them is a separate matter. And if you identify how they fly them and how they fight them, um, it can give you an advantage. Unless, of course, they're evil, scum-sucking people that orbit stations at two and a half kilometers <laughs> and then dock up as soon as they might get a potentially good fight. So again, knowing about yourself, knowing about your enemy. Uh, right, just having a quick summary before we get kicked out of here. Um, you have to think about what Clausewitz was doing. Clausewitz was talking, it, was, it wasn't quite a world war, but it was kind of fairly large. The Napoleonic Wars kind of covered all of Europe. So it was total war. The aim of that was to completely destroy your opponent and take everything they had. Does that apply to Eve? Yeah. Of course it bloody does. That's what Eve's all about, destroying your opponent and taking everything they've got. Uh, sorry? Well, what do they do? There you go. How do they have fun? Do they all mine or something? Right. He had large armies. It was large battles. You would have, I mean, I think when Napoleon went to uh, Moscow, I think he started off with 200,000 uh, troops, came back with 20,000, and most of them died of cholera and illness on the way rather than the actual battles. But, but it was large armies, loads of bloody battles, and the battles all joined up into huge big campaigns. But fundamentally, like I said, total war, unlimited objectives. He was there to completely destroy his opponent and take everything. And like we said, he came up with identifying what the aim is, concentrate your forces, identify your opponent's uh, centre of gravity, and, and attack. Don't get me wrong, he did come up with other ones. These are the ones that I've just pulled out, same with Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was slightly different. He lived in a period of dynastic wars. So you could almost choose which warlord to support. And it was small armies that would meet on a field, hack and slash each other for an afternoon, and then go home. Uh, anything that was left. Um, so he lived in a different time. So his thinking is slightly different. Uh, a limited objectives. It wasn't about completely destroying your opponent. It was just about winning that fight, because winning that fight would then have a knock-on effect. And what did he come up with? The ones I picked from him, inspiring leadership, concentrating your forces, gathering intelligence, and attack. So those key points, how many of them do we think can in some way apply to EVE Online? Okay, all of them. But actually, perhaps the way you play, none of them. And that's perfectly fine. I'm a great believer that we all pay to play this game. So we can all play it the way we want to play it, and that's fine. As long as you're not gate camping my stations. So... Having a look at the first slide and the last slide, and, uh, and stick it, you do realize I've got this uh, bounty on my head now. Um, actually, not a bounty, I prefer Snickers. Um, right, looking at the strategic things, what did they come up with? Uh, when you're looking at a strategic plan, identify what your aims are, and identify your enemy's aim and your center of gravity. Identify your own center of gravity as well. Why do you want to identify your own center of gravity? Because that's your critical vulnerability. If you can identify it, you can put risk management processes. I'm not getting into risk management because I love that stuff. Um, you can put risk management processes in place. Um, at the operational level, you can have inspiring leadership. And we've identified that, identified that some corporations may not have as inspiring a group of leadership as, uh, as they would like. We can gather intelligence. And I think one of the big things you guys have identified is that actually that's key to everything we do. We can surprise our opponents with that intelligence. We can react to things faster than them. We can get inside their OODA loop. You can keep them reacting, because if they're reacting, they're on the back foot. And at the tactical level, get your forces together and attack people a lot. I don't know how we're doing for time. We're probably slightly over. I've been Spanky Kala. Quick, quick one for people who heard of Broadcast for Reps. Right, you may not have heard of it. There's an in-game channel um, called Broadcast for Reps. Uh, there's also one in Slack as well, and I believe there's one in, in, uh, in Reddit. Not that I'd go anywhere near Reddit. Um, my blood pressure's high enough without that crap. Um, it's for anybody that's struggling with real life. Um, we lose a number of capsuleers a year uh, that take their own lives, and one is too many. We lost one about two or three weeks ago, and I believe from chatting to somebody, we might have lost another one three or four weeks ago. So if you know anybody that's struggling in-game, uh, broadcast for reps channel in game and also in Slack. Uh, there are a number of professionals in there. I'm a clinically trained professional. Um, but again, it's mostly people that have been through shit times in their lives. Uh, and they can offer a little bit of support and advice and potentially an ear uh, for whatever the person wants. So uh, please point anybody that way. Uh, and that's it for me. Any questions before we go? Bearing in mind that we have the, uh, 
the massive presentation on in 15 minutes. Take that as absolutely none. Go away. You are now generals in your army. You know how to defeat your opponent. Have a good fan fest.